All right, <laughs> let's think about maximum and minimum of this two variable function. Now, what we know about this function is that the maximum doesn't exist because you can make it as large as you want. The, the output of this function can be made to be as large as you want just by fixing one of them and increasing the other one. So for example, if I put 0 into x, so this is 0, and put like a million into y, a million squared is a trillion, so you can make this as large as you want. Is that a 2 or a z? Uh, I mean 2. Thank you. I usually, I usually put z like that. Right. Uh, however, this function has a minimum. And I want to figure out ways to find at what point it attains its minimum. Okay. So the first method is not the method that we'll be using here, because it relies on some really basic pre-calculus method. And it's not usually applicable for other situations. But here's this, the, the first method I want to show you. To find the minimum, this is what you want to do. You want to rewrite this as x squared minus 2x plus 1 minus 1 plus y squared. So I add 1 and subtract 1. Now why do I do that? That's because if I do it, then this becomes what? x minus 1 squared. It's a complete square, right? So I added 1 and subtracted 1 so that these two are the same. Right? If, if you add 1 and subtract 1, it's the same thing. But adding 1 gives you one part as a square, a complete square, and you get a negative 1, and then y squared. Now looking at this, then we can actually determine the minimum value, minimum possible value of this function. What is it? 1. No? What's the minimum possible value of this function? Negative one. <coughs> it should be negative one, right? Now, how would you know that? Well, think about it this way. If you have something squared, can this be negative? No. No. The least a square can be is zero. Zero squared is zero. That's the least it can be. Okay. How about this one? Y squared. The least it can be? Positive. Yeah, or zero. Okay. So. I know that this is 0 or more. I know this is 0 or more. Therefore, the entire thing has to be more than 0 plus negative 1 plus 0, which is negative 1. So I know that the least value this function can have is negative 1 when x is? No, what value should x, x be? x is 1, and y is? 0. When y is 0 and x is 1, this function at 1 comma 0 gives you the output negative 1, and that's the minimum. <coughs> and that's not the method that we want to use. Uh, see, we're in calc 3, so we really want to make use of derivatives. Okay. Uh, so how can we figure out this, this same fact, 1 comma 0 will give you negative 1. Well, I guess uh, one thing that you might want to do is uh, first say, well, the maximum doesn't exist, so if it has something, it must be a minimum. And if, if the function attains its minimum at some point, what do you know about if they're derivatives? Huh? It's equal to 0. Yeah. So, oh, by the way, if you write, write like this, the 
uh, you, you can think of it as z equal to x squared plus y squared, which is a paraboloid. We learned about paraboloids before. And if you, if you do x minus 1 squared plus y squared, that moves the paraboloid one step to the x, x direction, positive x direction. And then if you subtract 1, it, it lowers it down like that. So we know that it, it, is a, it is shaped like a bowl, so it has this minimum minimum at some point. All right, so it has a minimum. And if you think about what happens to its x, x, y, no, it's a, uh, the slice of this surface in, in either this direction or, or that direction, if you cut it either parallel to, so let's say here, this is the minimum. If you cut it parallel to the y, z plane, or if you cut it parallel to the x, z plane, Either way, you get a problem like that with minima happening right here, right? Therefore, let's say this is the uh, plane that's parallel to yz. Uh, let's say this. Actually, it's more like that. Okay, at this point, what's going to happen? What's the derivative of this function? Zero with respect to y, as you're moving in the y direction? Zero. It must be? Zero. Zero. How about derivative with respect to x? Zero. It'll also be zero. Uh, if that didn't convince you, here's another way to think about it. See, you're, you're in a basin, and you're at the, late, uh, the, the lowest plates of the basin. Okay? Think about the directional derivative as you're moving along. Okay? So just pick a direction, and you try to think about the directional derivative. Well, if you go a, s a little bit more further up, then you know that the derivative is increasing, right? I mean, the derivative is positive because the function is increasing. Your altitude is going up, right? But at the moment where you're there, what's the derivative? It's zero. Because in this trajectory, as you're moving along this, this one direction, the moment before you reach the minimum point, the derivative is negative because you're decreasing. The al your altitude is decreasing. And after you pass through this point, your altitude is increasing. Therefore, the moment where you, when you're at the minimum, the rate of change would be zero. So this type of argument can convince you that no matter what kind of directional derivative you choose, the derivative <coughs> will be zero. All directional derivatives will be zero at the minimum. Also, it's true for, for maximum. If you have a maximum, all the directional derivatives will be zero. But directional derivatives are really grainy and of F dotted with u. So if this is to be 0 for any kind of direction, what does that mean for this? It has to be 0. More specifically, it has to be 0 for 1, 0. But what's that? This is f differentiated by x and f differentiated by y. And you're trying to do a dot product with 1, 0. That has to be 0, right? which is just f differentiated by x, right? So partial derivative with respect to x is really the directional derivative in 1 comma 0 direction, okay? And if you use 0 comma 1, you can also show that round, f, round y is 0. In that case, this is 0, that's 0. So what do we know? We know that the gradient must be 0. Okay? So that, that's the argument I'm making. And if you recall what we did for calculus one when we found the maximum and minimum, it's very similar. In calculus one, we had something called uh, critical number, number in one variable calculus. What's a critical number? 
It's a critical number where uh, it's a point where. Yeah, yeah, it changes direction. What, but what does that mean for the derivative? Actually, that's not wholly true. It might not change direction. Any point where the derivative is equal to zero, or where it does, it does not exist. That's a critical number. Right? That's how you can learn. It. And in multivariable case, when you have f of x comma y, we can talk about something similar. We can say critical point is a point a comma b such that gradient of f of a comma b is <coughs> zero. But it's zero as a vector. And so both partial with respect to x and partial with respect to y should be zero. Okay? Or does not exist. We, we have the does not exist case because uh, in some cases, you might have a minimum by having a cusp. Right? In that case, uh, the derivative uh, does not exist at that point while still maintaining the minimum. Right? Now, why were we interested in critical numbers in Calc 1? The reason was, if you had a relative minimum or relative maximum, it always appeared at critical numbers, right? That's why. So, similar thing ap applies here. We're interested in such a point because we have the theorem, theorem which is, uh, if f x comma y has a relative extrema extremum at a comma b, then a comma b must be a critical point. <coughs> So that's a good good reason why we would like to have the critical point. Okay? Now going back to this question, let's see what that means for this one. If that did have a relative minimum, which actually means a global minimum in our context, it must happen at the critical point. Right? So let's write down the f partial with respect to x. What do you get if you differentiate by x? 2x minus 2. And y squared differentiates to 0 if you're differentiating by x, because partial derivative means you're treating y as a constant, right? What's round f round y? It says 2y. And you want both of them to be 0. For the gradient to be 0, it means that partial with respect to x should be 0, and partial with respect to y should be 0. OK, so what does that give us? The first thing would say x is? No, no, move the 2 to the other side and divide by 2. You get x equal 2, positive 1. The second one will say y is 0. Therefore, what's the point? 1, 0 is the critical number. Critical point. Okay? And that's it. We found the point without having to do algebra. We, we found out that 1 comma 0 is the point that it would obtain its minimum if there was one. And just by knowing that this is a quadratic <laughs> polynomial so that uh, all the xy trace, yz trace will, no, yz trace and xz trace will give you parabola, kind of convinces you that this is actually a paraboloid. If you know it's a paraboloid, then it, the, the relative minimum that you have better be the global minimum, right? So you can say, oh, here's the critical point. I know that that must be the uh, relative minimum, which is absolute minimum for this function, because it's a quadratic equation. And therefore, we can say, what's f of 1 comma 0? That means 1 is going into x, while uh, 0 is going to y. 
So it's 1 squared minus 2 times 1 plus 0 squared, which is 1 minus 2, which equals negative 1. So we know that this must be minimum when 1 comma 0 is evaluated into the function. Okay? So that's what critical points are. Okay? Now, um, it wasn't that hard to use this theorem for this function because this was a quadratic function. However, in general, uh, we have a problem. The problem is we don't know. We don't know whether the thing that you have is a relative minimum or relative ma maximum. See, we only know it, it, it's a possible location for relative extrema. Okay? Now, uh, you have to be really careful when you read mathematical theorems because often it doesn't mean what you think it is. Now, does this mean that if you have a critical point, it must be either the maximum or minimum? No. No. It only says if you have a relative extremum, it must have it must be a critical point. But being a critical point doesn't mean that it's a relative extremum. And actually, th this the following happens. Uh, there's a case where it's very different from from the one variable case, which is when you have something like a saddle. So if you had a saddle, then at, at this point, because in this direction it's the minimum point, the derivative in the x direction will be 0, whereas let's say this is the y direction. In this direction it's a problem going that way, still the directional derivative in the y direction is 0. So it's 0 in both directions, so it is a critical point, but this is neither a relative maximum nor relative minimum. Yeah, it, it's, it's a saddle point. Uh, it's, it's, it's lower than the nearby if you're going this way, right? But if you're going that way, it's higher than that point. So uh, if you look around this point, there are places where it's higher than that point, and there are places where it's lower than that point. So it's neither a relative maximum nor relative minimum, okay? So you can have a saddle. And, and that's why uh, in calculus 3, it's more complicated than calculus 1. So, so here's what, what must be done. We need to know, we need to come up with a way uh, to figure out whether the given critical point is a relative maximum, relative minimum, or it's a saddle. We have to distinguish between the three cases. How do we do that? Well, going back to the calculus 1 case, you learn to use uh, what? Uh, first derivative test and second derivative test, right? You learn to use those, right? Uh, here in Calc 3, the first derivative test is no good. It's not going to be uh, useful here because uh, you can't differentiate just one direction. You have to differentiate in every direction. It, it's har harder to do it. So in Calc 2, uh, Calc 3, in, in multivariable calculus, uh, something equivalent to cal equivalent to second derivative test is the only method that we'll be able to use, okay? And that's, uh, that's what I'm about to show you, okay? So using the second derivative test, something equivalent to a second derivative test, we'll be able to figure out if a given critical point is a relative extremum, a relative maximum, a relative minimum, or a saddle. 